thank you for coming here this morning. We really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you to everyone who has joined virtually. My name is Corey Cross. I work at Renaissance Re, uh, and I am also a member of our DEI committee. Uh, the title of our panel for today is The Bermuda Onion, Peeling Back the Layers of Intersectionality in the Workforce and Learning How to Promote Safer Spaces and Cultures. Um, intersectionality recognizes not only differences between identities, such as racial, gender, LGBT plus identities, but the connections within these. As such, it is important that we recognize overlapping identities and that everyone has their own unique experiences of marginalization, oppression, in order to be truly inclusive. Using a combination of spoken word, poetry, and panel discussion, this event will explore intersectionality in the workplace and how individuals and organizations can promote safer spaces and work cultures. Our panel participants who represent various identities and professional backgrounds will discuss their experiences of oppression, discrimination, allyship, and triumph in the workplace whilst educating the audience on how organizations and individuals can work towards making their workspaces more inclusive. Our panelists for today are Maya Palacio, who will be our moderator, she is the founder and editor of Media Maya. Kristen White, who is a writer, creative, entrepreneur, and co-finder of Brackish Pond Literary Collective and owner of Long Story Short. Aisha Townsend, who is a writer, creative, and poet, and the other co-founder for Brackish Pond Literary Collective. Wendell Hunt, a claims professional who works at Renaissance Re. Birgit van Jarsveld, organizational psychology specialist. Adrian Hartnett Beasley, board chair for Out Bermuda and Jessica Lewis, who is a three-time Paralympian. To start our event, Kristen and Aisha will start with a performance entitled, A Cacophony. What is the sound of your space? Imagine the notes, drumming fingers of impatience, tap, 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 tapping tap, tap, feet tap, tap, of anxiety, grinding jaws, clicking pens, a loud jubilation of joy, a, yob. a silence. The deep guttural sigh of sadness, fast heartbeats of nerves, the low whispers of othering, the quiet cries of disappointment. The fake laughs, oh so many fake laughs, the forced joviality in the face of isms and schisms and just bad jokes. Sucking my teeth, mutter under my breath, murmuring at my desk, deep breath in, exhale out. J Each breath. sound and emotion, a response to an internal thought, to an external interaction. But what will it sound like what will it sound when like? you decide to be brave? Ayo, hey, Summer isn't as special as she thinks she is. She doesn't get to lay claim to skin and laughter and bodies rolling in sand and surf and grass and running at dawn when it's cool out. She doesn't get to be synonymous with sleeveless and halter and short short and miniskirt. Cause what seasonal word if there are no seasons for you? If every season is the same, if your wardrobe is a factory for a uniform, long sleeve this, oversized that, everything is a cover up so I never need to buy one. All my years are a blur of whatever I wore to the beach, being beach wear. Cause I didn't lose my baby fat, didn't shed the preteen and puberty chubby, still kept that freshman 15, and Lord, after 20s and 30s and that extra COVID-19, never known svelte. Who's she? Ain't never shot marbles with skinny. You know her? Ain't had a drink with slim. Nah, fam, she's evasive. So when I go to the beach, it's a place to shield. Grab a towel, grab a long tee, grab a light jacket, anything to not be the beach whale on a summer camp field trip or that, you know, um, heavy set girl at the bonfire. Nah, give me a cloak. So I don't have to be seen, don't have to be noticed, don't have to burn, blister, or actually feel the water on my skin when I swim. It's cool. I don't have to be special. Not like summer, summer is a turn up. Ayo, hey, all your creeps so summer can run. Full hot and wide open, Bradford. I take everything, everything off. Tired of layering against a damp chill that penetrates to your chest. That's your granny would say. I don't want no cable net. I want my shoulders out. No Levi 501s. I want cutoffs, sandals, heat, feeling it between my toes. My biggest decision every day is deciding between a boy short or a bikini bottom. Making sure I have enough sunblock to coat my midriff. It burns and pick up football. Volleyball. Frisbee games as if it wasn't worth it. All of it's a game. Climbing on top of other burnt shoulders to chicken fight and hitting the water with swallowing laughter. I beached myself belly full, honestly. 
How, How could you, you not be happier? happier? Welcome to L.F. Wade International Airport, here in the Devil's Isle, where for four long colonial centuries, this mysterious island has been an epicenter of growth at any cost. Enjoy a curl dark and stormy on beautiful pink sands, but beware of fire coral, classism, racism, ableism, sexism, queer hate, and Portuguese man of war. Enjoy up. your stay, and if you're on your way back home, welcome home. Left turn. And now I'm here. I can't, can't believe, believe I'm, I'm in Bermuda. Bermuda. Bahama, come on, pretty mama. Can't wait to buy some Bermuda shorts. Short, short. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna wear them, them forever. 21 square miles of exotic promise and opportunity. Smell that incredible salted air with minimal crime and unity. Okay, I know I'm being idealistic, but I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. I'm from Leeds. I'm from Winnipeg. I'm from Minnesota. I've never seen anything like this. Look how blue. Wow. Look how friendly. Hi. Look how clean. Yes. Oh, the queen is on their money. That's cute. The bread is $6. Oh my gosh. I don't remember seeing that in my Google searches. But I do recall reading that there were lots of black people here, but I don't see them in this company, in this bar, in this club. I'll meet them soon. Oh, this taxi is taking me a different way. I've never seen this part before. Have you seen this part before? I've never seen this part before. Oh, we're here. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I just left, left home, home and now I'm back. I can't, can't believe, believe I'm in Bermuda. Bermuda. She said no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. So who would choose to lay themselves back in the jaw? Fold their limbs between the teeth. We run for many, so reasons. many reasons. And when the hook extends across the sea to pull us back, the salt settles into the crooks of our ears and the sound of our lament whistles by. We try to wrestle the noise into gratitude, into the birthrights of our another, another world, world, and proud to be into the sound of our Nana's big spoon in the peas and rice pan, and the hey yo, and hey bye, and how's your mama doing? Yo, tell us hi. But amidst that din are the parents and pastors decrying our <laughs> lifestyle, lifestyle choices. choices, and another chance at marriage equality crashing to the ground. The gaping, yawning chasm of inequity and the high-pitched clang and grit-on-grit -grit metal of closed doors. The guidance counselors advising us to forego a dream for an opportunity, so we do, and then are called overqualified, underqualified, not, not qualified, because we did not quite fit the culture, culture of the department. And they meant that they hated the way our bowels dragged and that we sneered at them in their favorite ace girl trucker hat. Hated the way our last names remind them that they, we are of this rock and they are not. Or that they are. And that's why our last names are the same. Ayo, hey, I'm telling you, right? These are the golden years. My mama told me that youth only happens once, so live it like a vote. And this place, the fountain for eternal youth, all carefree and worry less. Hallways are kingdoms. Everywhere the sharpie graffiti touches. All of this a memory we're living, because there's nothing like football games against the other high school. Rise from the tuck shop. Recess basketball. Flirting by the lockers before the next bell. I crown myself prom royalty and skip through years like a hopscotch god. Class is a breeze. That blurs way too early from a teacher with front lines I'll never have. How can it get better than this? Yo, skipping class to run to get lunch in the city, or cheeky little dip to the beach, all of it a piss take and a close call, laughing all the way to home room. There's nothing like running back to class, panting chest, trying to make it back before the back bell rings. rings like a prison call. Get inside. Yo, get in your place. Stay in your lane. Ain't no more organized caste system than in a schoolyard. Clicks cliche in mass. I keep my hair done. That way no one can say I'm looking at them the wrong way. I'm looking at them at all. Or looking right. Looking left. When there's always a reminder for you to know who you are if you don't fit in, if you're not the default and exist as a slur, if you're ugly, wrong shoes. too fat, too poor, too gay, can't run, face exploding in pimples, need braces, have braces, need to brace for a punch or a push. I can't wait to leave this place. My, my trauma, trauma starts here. In a locker room, I can't change in. On a sports field, I can't run on. In a full auditorium, I just tripped in front of in a classroom, I can't speak in without being laughed at. I know the viscosity of a spitball. I know what a sucker punch feels like to an eye. I know the interior of a locker room and a bathroom store that can easily substitute for a lunchroom. My bruises are map points that lead me back here. The place where I learn nothing but fur and how cruel we truly can be together. Well, 
welcome to Bermuda. Let me give you a tour of the property. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Thank you, it's so beautiful here. You're so well-spoken. I love your hair, I love your skin. Is this art local? Is this fruit local? Is this local? Oh my God, did I mention I love your hair? You're so lucky to live here. Are you a native? Like, are you from here? I am not simply from here, I am of. Bermuda, shaped and molded by hurricane winds, a sternum of dead cedar, marrow of limestone, a map is laid into my scalp, and my breath is a plume of salt and sorrow. A sigh of cahal feather and Sally Bassett ash. I am in a paradise, and there is a paradise within me. I am in a desert, and there is a desert within me. Yes, I'm from here. Oh my God. She just looked at me like I'm one of those, those tourists. tourists. Uh, why am I rambling on so much? Are you a native? You're so well spoken. Why did I say that? Uh, I'm cool, I promise. I, cool. I really want to ask her about the history and the politics and the culture, but now it's like. Don't count on my to make things easier. So, what's your favorite drink? <laughs> Vodka water roses. <laughs> Rum swizzle. <laughs> At what, what point does celebration become, become exploitation? exploitation? This place is a mausoleum, one-way train. You walk the hallways, you run the gauntlet. Walls are painted thick with last words. Who needs an IV when there's tears? Bedside manner for doorknobs. Everyone's trained in. I'm so sorry. We had to. It's almost time. She's near the end. This is where you come to lose. Bring your last rights and gamble them. I brought my mother here to live and they put her in a drawer. The footsteps on this floor sound like a dirge, a funeral march, click clacking in time to a fading heartbeat. I hate this place, this, this can't be real. real. It's frigid air, it's hushed voices, it's rooms fitted to keep you comfy, like a coffin, a siren sounds and promises to take you to safety and instead they wheel you through these, these doors, doors open to new life. First breath, I met my daughter on the 13th of Friday at 12 minutes past four. Time stretches when it stops and life begins over and over again. Waiting in holes, dripping with hope. These wards have promise. Outside the breath and sweet, the atmosphere is a baka now. now. Precipitates impossibles. Your tan fingers, tan toes to count again and again just to make sure this re the real, this, this can't, can't be, be real. real. How life can double in an instant. How two can become four, four can become five, and crying here is a, a sign of working lungs. Learning air, a voice sounding for the first time, becoming. Now we find ourselves here, in this place. Borrowing your stapler, transcribing your minutes, sending your memos, yucking it up at the water cooler at the company provided lunch, responding to your email and your email. Oh, I haven't responded to your email yet. Always equipped with a joke ready or substantial fact to prove my credibility. Because my degree ain't enough. Or having a quick whip, quick witted retort to any instance of mansplaining, mansplaining for the job I was hired to do. I'm gonna show up as whoever works well in this space. Loud, quiet, sharp, witty, smart as a whip. The epitome of multifaceted. Both sides of the coin flipped on fate. If the whole beginning of insurance was insuring bodies, what's the value of mine? A few hundred and some yards of ancestry removed. Her like a scar. Something worth remembering, but always hope to forget.
you've been deafened by the loud chorus of this is mine created for me, of me, by me, and my fathers, and their fathers, and, their and, fathers, and, and the their confident fathers, rhythm and of my name sits above fathers. the door and on the signature line. But now, you are starting to listen to the ambience of the only mm, recently, recently welcomed, welcomed, who have had to soft shoe dance around the unsaid. There is a cracking and growing echo of I, I belong, belong here, here too. too. This is the moment where the disparate voices, the cacophony, the noise becomes music. It's time, time to, to build, build an, an orchestra. orchestra. A harmony of every perspective being heard. The rousing voice that turns the one into 10, into it's, it's about, about all, all of us. All of us. In stanza one, you let the fates guide you. But in stanza two, you're ready. Are you ready? You're ready, you ready? to meet the obstacles head on and be, be brave. brave. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for being here and being present with us today. So before we get started on the panel, I want to want to ask everyone to just do me a quick favor. Just close your eyes for a second. And repeat these words <coughs> in your head as I say them. And just take deep breaths. Deep breath in. Everyone here wants to see me succeed. Out. Deep breath in. Everyone here wants to learn something new. Deep breath in. Everyone here wants to be better and wants to leave better from this space. Last one. Deep breath in. It's okay to feel uncomfortable when I'm learning something new. Deep breath out. Okay, you could open your eyes now. <coughs> That's just something that I normally like to do just to keep everyone a bit more calm and getting ready for this type of conversations that we're about to have. I'd like to thank the panel here um, for showing up and being on this discussion with me. And I know that Corey already introduced everyone and got to know a little bit about them, but I'm going to ask everyone just to repeat yourself again. Just tell me your name and tell me why you are on this panel today. Adrian. Um, <clears throat> Adrian Hartnett Beasley. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the chair of Out Bermuda, and I believe that I have a voice that um, should be heard in Bermuda as well as um, giving a voice to the LGBT community as well, especially in, um, as we talk about dive in and workplace psychological safety. Hi everybody, I'm Kristen. Uh, I am a local creative that is super passionate about Bermuda history and culture. And I feel that in any conversation about where our country wants to go, we should be talking about a bit about where we've been. Uh, and so I hope that's the voice that I can provide today on the panel. I am Aisha Townsend. I'm going to take what Kristen said about culture and history and stuff. <laughs> that matters to me, too. I'm also a lecturer at the Bermuda College. And as a person who is at the forefront of education, I hope that I am a good representative and representation for people within my, my shoes and space and all my intersectionalities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Birgit van Jarschot. I'm originally qualified as an organizational industrial psychologist. And about 10 years ago, I sort of reskilled in doing individual and group therapy work. And I'm really passionate about workspaces, creating workspaces uh, where people feel safe, where, where people and organizations can flourish. And I hope I can add some value to the discussion today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Bandu Hunt. I'm coming from Renaissance Reinsurance. Um, I'm just hoping that my opinion can be heard. And um, I think I have a lot to offer. And, um, Hi, um, I'm Jessica, and I'm a, a lead para athlete, and I've competed at three Paralympic Games. Um, and I hope that today I can kind of shed some light on maybe the misconceptions that people have around disability. Awesome. Thank you, guys. OK, so I do not really have a little bit of time to digest the spoken word that was just on display and very touching. I just got to ask Chris and Aisha, can you break that down a little bit for us? what we just heard. Go, Chris. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we received, I would say, a, a pretty broad uh, call to action from the Renri team. We've done a lot of work with Renri. 
um, as part of the Br Brackish Pond Literary Collective, we do lots of workshops with companies around Bermudian history, literature, culture. Um, we've done a lot with different companies, diversity, equity, and inclusion departments. Um, and so I think Renry sort of trusted us to be creative and, and create something powerful. And in thinking of it, um, it was something that my mom said. We've been at the hospital a lot recently with my uh, brother, and I've been there, and I'm leaving, and it's the worst day ever. I'm in the parking lot crying, and I see people walking in with balloons and flowers, and I'm just like, wow, we're in, two, we're in the same space and experiencing it completely differently. And so I was thinking on that, and then one day, as we were sitting in my brother's hospital room, my mom was just like listening to the place, and she was like, every place has a sound. I'm like, all right, Terry, <laughs> that was bad. Uh, and so we just sort of bounced off of that and thought about how you could be listening to the same sounds as someone else, being in the exact same moment, in the exact same place, and having a completely different experience. And so as we apply that to the workplace, you know, if we're not accepting and uh, honoring and acknowledging that people are coming into this space and they may feel completely different than you feel in this space, and if we're not giving the opportunity for them to be able to voice that, then we're never really going to usher in this new era of equity and justice so we wanted to before we talked about insurance talk about places where the difference in how people are experiencing a place a is disparate. quite stark and so that you could sort of get that so of course at the beach you know some people are like yes and other people are like oh my god I hate it here I'm bad I have this here in school which we know for some people was like they were the bell of the ball and others of us were not uh, and, you know and so forth and so forth a hospital an airport where someone's you know arriving to Bermuda for the first time and they're feeling you know excited about what Bermuda is going to be for them and someone else is coming back having left Bermuda because they felt disenfranchised, disempowered, felt that they didn't have access um, and, and now they're having to come back home and, and the difference in that. So that's how we approach the piece. Um, and so the soundtrack was meant to sort of move you in and out of the different spaces. Uh, we also really wanted to talk about the foundations of insurance and put a bit of that in the piece. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was, that was what we did. Hopefully everybody liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. That was honestly creatively done. And one of the questions I actually had in here was for you, Aisha, because I thought about you know, you know, intersectionalities and the conversations that we're having today about diversity and inclusion and making everyone feel safe in a workspace. And I immediately went to this instance when I was in university and I used to just think one day, just, it just came to me like, why do I not feel like I'm smart here? Why do I feel like I'm struggling? Why do I feel like I'm not getting complimented what others are? I was one of two only black people in my school. Um, that graduated, and I remember just thinking of this one day, looking at the school and thinking, you know what, this place was not built with me in mind. Like, it didn't have me in mind. And, you know, they never really addressed, you know, how the institution was built and things like that. So my question for you is, should companies, like you mentioned, like insurance companies or any other corporate company, should be addressing maybe the history of themselves within the, either in their space privately or publicly? Always. <laughs> Um, because I'm a literary person, I'm going to have to cycle it back to some sort of literary faction. But James Baldwin said, you should always know from whence you came. Um, it's important because you start out on a path and maybe you don't really finish it. Think, if you think about life as a relay and everyone's kind of passing the baton, and you think about a company that is moving forward without the people who started it, you still need to know where we start, where did we start out at? Because it will dictate where we're going. And as we continue to grow and evolve through time, through history, we will have different people, we will have different instances. I was schooled at Warwick Academy, which is the oldest school in Bermuda, but I'm sure that I was the not the ideal in the Western Hemisphere. Hey. Historian, man, <laughs> love having her in my back pocket. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that I was not the intended student for that space, but I'm, I was well aware of that, and I was equipped with that knowledge when I went there. That does shape your experience, especially if it is something that's hushed and isn't addressed to and attended to, then it makes you feel like you aren't important enough to have that information, and it removes any onus and responsibility of where this place, this space, this company, this organization should go. Now, Wendell, I'm going to throw a question at you in relation to that. So when it comes to being in spaces and corporate spaces, and maybe, maybe some corporations have taken the time to figure out what they can do to be inclusive, have you ever personally been a part or seen any type of things being done to help with inclusivity in the corporate space? And have you seen that work, or did it fail? 
Um, just thinking back to um, a couple of places that I've worked, I have seen some inclusivity in um, the workplace, and I've seen it work to a degree. Now, without naming the company, I don't want to put them on blast <laughs> here, but um, you know, they had this diversity program that was new while I was there. Um, I actually joined their um, little their group that they had to help um, branch out the diversity and to get more inclusivity from everyone there. Um, that worked to a degree, and what I mean by a degree is you had more fair-skinned people, more people from U European people that were joining in and um, trying to see what they can do to help out. How can I be of more help to not only the company but to the community? To whereas comparing that with the, um, the Bermudians or if you want to say the black folk in the company um, or persons of color, they did not join in. Um, I wouldn't say that it was um, um, an, a factor of them trying not to be more inclusive, but it was more or less of them you know, just, oh, this is another one of those health topics. We're just going to talk. Nothing's going to happen. Um, that's all we seem to do these days is just talk and more talk, and there's no action. So that those folks that didn't join, I actually had conversations with them about it and said, you know, why don't you come? And then, like I said, they, they, they each one said that, you know, we're just going to talk. That's it. There's going to be no real change. So I've actually, in talking to them, I got them to join in, and, you know, it lifted the culture. So to speak, I wasn't there for much longer after, I think I left a few months after that, but the culture, um, the interactions with everyone, it lifted within the um, workspace. So I, want, I would like to think that I left it in a um, much better space than it was when I was there because it was, you know, everyone that was there had their different culture. So, you know, you had a lot of people from Europe, they were there, you know, they were in their space, the Bermudians were in their space. Um, and then the cultural differences were just very vast. I was speaking to someone today and talking about how um, folks in Japan and how they interact. You know, they don't, they're not um, folks that come and say, oh, good morning, good afternoon, like mm -hmm. your average Bermudian, you know, for, for your average Bermudian, good morning, good afternoon. It's a part of our culture. You know, we expect that. And then we're saying good morning, good afternoon. You don't say back, it's like, oh, what's their problem? You know, um, who raised them? Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, um, those folks, and it was, it was just interesting because over on that side of the planet, they don't, that's not part of their culture. It's for them, it's more respect, more respectful to, um, well, so I'm told it's more respectful for them to come in, be quiet, wait until it's their turn, and then say something, right? right? Now, so I want to, so I want to keep continuing on that point when it comes to different cultures, but I have to ask, what was probably like the issue within the corporation that you were working on, you were in the group? What was something that was like a target issue there that you guys were trying to resolve? before you left? Was there something specific? Uh, more specifically, it was, um, well, I think it was, as I was just saying, just inclusivity. Because there was, and it was, speaking of just um, um, the, these young ladies with their um, little poem thing that they had going on about. First of all, Wendell, I'm the same age as you. <laughs> I was just going to say, I was 15 minutes, so it wasn't a little poem. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying Spoken to be word. nice here. I'm trying Spoken to be nice. Word. Respectful. Any respectful. Any stretch of the imagination. So, um, Thank you. And it was sort of like, um, like in a high school with a lunch hall, right? You had your faction over there, your cool guy faction, um, your not cool faction, your athlete faction, right? So during lunches, you know, you've had, you had your cliques, right? Your Europeans will be there, your Asians will be there, your Bermudians will be here, your Africans will be there. And so what we were trying to do was to get people to um, mesh well together, you know? So normally I would sit, my thing is I would sit, have lunch by myself at my computer or I would leave and go do something. So I actually made an effort to um, have a conversation with someone else. You know what, um, today I'm gonna sit lunch and sit down and have lunch with Kate today. We, we normally only talk about work, but today I'm gonna sit down and talk about the weather. Um, does she have any children? Um, is she here on Bermuda alone? I don't know because we have no interaction. So mm -hmm. that's something that we were working on. And from my memory before I left, there was more interaction amongst the people. I would like to think that they're still doing that, but I haven't spoken to them for some time now. Right. So. Forget, I, um, I'm going to ask you because you do a lot with organizational spaces and trying to help things become more like safe. So. Is that an initiative that can actually work, or do you have an idea that can actually probably encourage more inclusivity in those spaces? Yeah, I, I think that you know, Wendell is really touching on something that that's that's quite important, you know, and and I think a part of 
trying to, because what, what is it ultimately that we want to achieve? We want to achieve an inclusive culture where people feel that they belong, where there's an awareness and where there's a connection. And, yeah. and sort of that sort of action that you take, building a relationship is exactly what companies need. So, so and once we start to talk about intersectionality, it becomes an impossible topic. It is, it is so complex and there's never a resolution. You can never get to a place where there, there's, this is the solution, this is a resolution to that. And then if you, if you try to, de to, to design a solution and then apply it into an organization, it is so difficult because you, you can't be arrogant and think that this is my solution and this is gonna resolve all the issues within the organization. How do I move from a polarized culture within my organization from them and us to a place where I really feel connected and, and where I do belong? So, so and, and obviously there's structures that we need to put in place. We, we have to address the culture. We have to, to create a psychologically safe workplace with, with the organization. But, but how do we achieve that? And once we've created that transformational sort of space and psychological safety, what is then the, the conversations that, that we have to have with, within that? And, and to give you context in that is, <coughs> I'm so privileged to be on this panel today, but I'm actually quite, I, I'm quite, I was quite reluctant to be here. <laughs> so, so let me put that in context. <coughs> I'm a white South African guy, right? So I know all too well how uncomfortable and how vulnerable it is to have these conversations. And, and not only to be part of the conversations, but e even just to witness the conversations. It's a very vulnerable space to be. So, so the only thing that I've learned over the years is that I can, I can only show up authentically as myself and, and create a space where other people can bring the complete complexity of identity into that space, while I'm also bringing my own complexity um, of my identity into that space as a, a gay, white, um, male, South African that's, that's trying to do organizational and, trans and intercultural development work in Bermuda and sometimes failing at it, right? So, so how do we then bring that into an organization where we can have brave conversations and, and just show up um, and, and have and, and build, build connections. So it's about, it's not about solution. It's not about um, resolution. It really is about trying to be on a journey to move closer to understanding and to build those connections within the organization. Uh, follow up to that. What's something that anyone in here can take with them like tomorrow as like a starting point of what you can do to like make the workplace more inclusive? Now I'm not trying to talking about the whole thing, but maybe even just the little section <coughs> yeah. in, in the workplace. You know, somewhere you have a group of five people or something working on a project. What's something that they can do themselves to help build it and make it more, you know, safer? Yeah, I, <coughs> I think that the starting point for me in this is, I mean, if, if, if I ask the audience today, what, what, if, if you think about a homeless person, what's the best survival options of a homeless person? Is it to be in a small countryside town or is it to be in a city with all the infrastructure of a city? So, so what does the audience say? If you just show your hands. So, so does this homeless person have better survival skills within a small town? Or does it have a better survival options in a bigger city where there's more resources? Mm. So, so research has actually shown that, that, that it's, there's a better survival in smaller communities. And the reason for that is that we think someone else will take care of it in a city. It's because it's so big, and the same thing happened in organizations as well. We think someone else is gonna take care of it. So my, my advice to, to everyone in this room and to everyone listening is that, and, and the small uh, committees in the workplace, it's, it's about you. The, the, the responsibility is it's about each single person walking out of this room and being brave enough to go and put your foot in it, to, to have the conversations. Um, but then also have the responsibility to get your foot out of it responsibly to, to say that I've made a mistake, I've maybe impacted you in a, with a microaggression or something that I've said or done. Um, and, and that's being brave, right? It's being brave to have the conversations and take personal accountability for making a change and for building connection. Awesome, thank you. I'm actually curious to know why everyone thought it would be a bigger city, but I mean, I know you explained it well because I was just like smaller, right? Because like, like I'm thinking you know your com community better. Like after a while, like even us in Bermuda, we see the same people we kind of get to know them, so kind of do feel a sense of responsibility for that as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to like kind of asking you guys about some personal experiences. First, I'm gonna start with you, Adrian, and my question for you is, looking at my book here because I already left it, Kate. Based on how you identify, what is the biggest misconception people have about you at the workplace? Uh, um, <coughs> sorry, yeah, it's a, it is a great question. I, I struggled with this one. Um, 
because I don't, I, I carry a lot of privilege. I'm cisgendered, white, male, Bermudian, um, tall. And so I, I carry a lot of privilege. So I, not a lot of people have come to me and said, hey, I once thought this thing of you because you were gay. And then later on, I realized I was wrong. You know, so I don't, I don't get that a lot. What I do get, though, and I'm sure this resonates with a lot of, um, a, lo a lot of the black people on the panel um, and the women, for sure, is that the way I show up often gets repackaged by people at work and then served back to me as me not being professional. You know, who I am is sort of like, oh, it's what's well, not because of who you are. It's the, the, this the way you did it or the way you did it. And so when I see that, that's when we get to talk about intersectionality, I think diversity of thought is also something that where my intersections meet gay. I'm an amiable expressive. You know, I work in an industry that is very analytic. And um, there are a lot of drivers in the audience, probably. Um, and so I sit in a space that is very flexy. I'm consistently having to expend my energy to um, go, OK, is it, gosh, is this because of who I am? Or am I just not being professional? So I think about it a lot that way. Um, and so in, in terms of uh, how I show up, um, I try and show up authentically as myself. Um, but I do find myself flexing a lot to ensure that I fit in with the space so that I'm, so because I think like in your 13 minutes spoken word, amaze ballsness. Yes, not <laughs> little poem. Amaze little poem. poem. <laughs> I, I genuinely thought, I was like, I don't need to say anything. It served up everything. I was, I learned, I was uncomfortable. I even changed what I was, how I was gonna answer some stuff. Um, I think that we just have to, uh, yes, I definitely felt that way. Um, and I hope, I hope that I'm being able to challenge that now because of my privilege though, but a lot of people don't have that. Well, what did you, like how does that affect you mentally even, having to like, I don't know, change who you are, adjust who you are, just so other people uh, feel comfortable? Just talking about this today. <coughs> so I, for sure, have been on the struggle bus a couple of times, right? Um, it, uh, I'm, because I'm an amiable, amiable expressive, if anyone's done a work personality, that's me at the bottom left corner. <laughs> I take everything personally, that's in professional life, personal life. I actually have a life coach. It's something I think really highly of. Um, sorry, I think it's really important for me. And so I really, um, I try and manage taking things personally. Um, so uh, taking things professionally, even if people mean them in a, it, it, even if someone's being shirty or yeah. not professional themselves, I have to comport myself and, and just, I have to be me and be psychologically safe for me mm. in, that, in that instance. I'm gonna jump down to Jessica, because like, what's something that people often, you know, think about you and your experiences and how you feel that probably isn't true? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I just wanted to say before I start is that, um, you know, I'm an individual living with a physical disability, and the whole realm of disability is so vast that you know the experiences that I have could be completely different to someone that has an indiv uh, an invisible disability. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind when I'm talking about my experiences. Um, but I, I kind of know from um, growing up in a community that you don't really see a lot of people with disabilities um, was something that um, was a real struggle for me to even accept who I was and accept that I had this disability and I was gonna live the rest of my life in a wheelchair. Um, and I think that also stems from um, kind of the stereotypes or the attitudes that people have towards with people with disabilities that you know, a disability means inability. And that's something that's so not true. Um, and it really took me going out and finding an environment where I felt comfortable and I was seen for more than just my disability. And that even though I had a disability, I could still, you know, um, set goals for myself and accomplish incredible things in my life. Um, and that's all thanks to an uh, amazing organization here, Windreach Bermuda. Um, which offers programs for people with disabilities. Um, and I think there just needs to be that, that shift in um, how people view it, that disability is not a bad thing. Thank you for bringing up um, when we, because was, that was a question I was gonna ask you. Is it like a good option even for like organizations like when we should like come into corporations? Do you think that'll be a valuable thing for them to do to partner in that way? Absolutely, definitely. because. There's, there's not really many um, organizations here that work directly with people with disabilities. And it's all about bringing um, 
those people into the conversation. Because I'm a huge believer in if you don't live something, you don't fully understand it. Um, so it's you know being brave and going out there and making sure that you're asking the questions of the people um, that you know it's directly affecting. Uh, I can say for myself personally, like growing up in public school systems all the time, like this part of Bermuda, corporate Bermuda, never seemed like an idea for me when I was younger. Um, like I said to you today, and then you mentioned back, like this is the first time I've ever been in this building before. Mm -hmm. And like I called, I was like, which one do I step into? Because like this isn't, you know, this isn't where I normally am. And even growing up, it never seemed like an option for me. Now that you've been here, it's your first time here, and I don't know, you see what it's like, and you see the people around. Like normally representation matters, because obviously I didn't have that, I didn't know anyone in this space, so I couldn't necessarily see myself being in this space. And how does that feel for you, like coming in today? Do you think that like, if you were younger, was you know corporate Bermuda, was that an idea for you to actually ever be attainable? Um, I don't really think so. Um, I think um, I was very fortunate to get involved with Windreach when I was five, so um, I've kind of always been in that kind of safe realm of um, you know different um, sporting programs or anything like that. So I think I kind of just fell in love with the sporting world because that was a world that really accepted who I was and allowed me to grow as a person. Um, so I don't think I ever really thought about being in kind of a corporate workforce um, just because of that. So. Thank you. Um, Aisha, okay. hey. I have a question for you. <clears throat> Explain to me what code switching is. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, because I, I thought you was going to ask me the last question, and I was going to talk about code switching. Right, um, so code <laughs> switching is essentially trying to fit wherever you can, right? It's maneuvering by whatever means and any means possible that you have at your disposal. Shout out to Malcolm Max, that's who I coded it just now. I always have to give a citation, because that's what I'm teaching right now in school. So. Um, <laughs> It's something that I am quite familiar with because I am always navigating between whatever um, whatever identity is taking um, the foreground of me at that moment. Is it my blackness? Is it my queerness? Is it my womanness? Is it my artistry? Whatever. So I am always making sure to to show up in a way that 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 fits that space. Um, it's something actually that I spoke with my students about. I'm realizing that I talk about them a lot now. The, the, just bleeding into my life. It's, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to happen, but it has. <laughs> um, but we, I gave them an assignment in which I wanted them to speak academically. And before I had them write and speak academically, I asked them to speak colloquially, which is this speaking in a way in which is most natural and conversational in the community that you occupy. Now, colloquial speaking for me is I'm gonna call Kristen and speak very colloquially to him. I'm like, well, go on, sister, what you're saying. And that is how I talk. It isn't a caricature for me because that is 100% how I speak all the time. And I am always switching in between that. Um, and I wanted to hit home and prove the point to my students that this isn't a bad way. Of course, that's been subjugated over years and times because it is a way in which it was how we can control a subset of people. Um, but in order to shift to an academic speaking, we have to be able to move without using certain terms. I won't call them slang because that's not what they are. But certain words that aren't as comfortable that have a little bit more rigidity or a structure in a certain way. So when it comes to code switching, it is and has been had the, the impetus behind it that you may not belong in what form you are showing up in at this place. So you need to conform to a certain degree. And that is true. But it can also be there is duality to code switching, wherein I am going to show up in this space as it is most comfortable for me, not just for you. OK? When I get off the plane and I see someone at Customs that I know, I'm going to be like, <laughs> you cool brethren. <laughs> and then when I get up to my office at West Hall at 22, 21 Stonington Avenue, I'm going to speak to my colleague, good afternoon, Dr. Talaram. How are you doing? It's <laughs> so nice to see you. Because I am in this space in which makes me feel most comfortable. I will not be hailing my colleague with a wagwan, sister, you cool. <laughs> it is what makes me feel most comfortable. And especially as a woman who is black and queer, 
and of the Caribbean diaspora, it's necessary to be able to navigate so that I am most comfortable because the world is fraught with isms that has made sure to allow me to know I am not comfortable in these spaces or mm -hmm. safe. Thank you. I like the pr perspective that you put on that because often we, I think of code switching, I think of having to change to make someone else feel comfortable. But you put it back to showing off and what makes you feel most comfortable. Now, Wendell, I'd like to ask you like a similar question to piggyback off of that one. Like, do you have a similar same experience when it comes to that? Have you ever, you know, done code switching yourself? Most definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I personally hate code switching. I hate it because it's been ingrained into me from young that I have to present myself a certain way. I cannot be authentically me. And it's strange, because, that's not strange, but it happens so often that I don't even notice when I'm doing it now, right? So certain times when I come into work, I'm not even addressing certain people, just addressing my colleagues, even if they are of the same complexion as me. I tend to code switch. It's been so ingrained in my DNA now. I mean, you learn it from school, and they, it just gets pumped into, you know, you can't present yourself that way. What will people think? Right, and um, it's this is where I find it hilarious because when you're talking to people from other cultures, as far as I know, they don't code switch. This is who they are. They present themselves as they are. They use their um, their ter their terminology from where they're from, and it's fine here in Bermuda. And we ex as Bermudians, and I'm not going to say as a Black Bermudian, but as Bermudians, we accept that, right? So the problem with that is that we accept that but we can't accept that from ourselves. We feel we have to code switch so those folks can understand us. We code switch so other Bermudians don't ridicule us, right? And it's, quite frankly, for me, it's exhausting. I hate it, but like I said, it's so ingrained in my DNA now that I can't, it's, it, a lot of times I find myself, oh my gosh, I'm, 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 I'm hurt up putting on the proper voice so everyone can understand me. Like, no, let me, let me just be me, say what I wanna say, and move on. Right? right, and it's 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 hard to do. However, you know, um, I've experienced that so many times. Job interviews, right? Um, conversations, even right now here on the panel, I'm using better words so people can understand. Because I'm thinking of, so my words can come across clear, and so everyone can understand me. So no one's like, what did he say? And you know, and because as Bermudians, we're constantly trying to. Um, we're constantly thinking of the people that come to our island, right? Making them comfortable, you know, because you know, we're a small community, right? And we depend on people coming. We depend on corporate business. We depend on tourists coming here, right? So we want more of them to come here. So it starts with that. So we, we want to make them comfortable. We want to get people to come back because without them, you know, without corporate business, without the tourists, you know, we'll struggle. We're an import country. We import everything, including people, right? So if in, in importing these people, we're importing all these various different cultures. And mm -hmm. so majority of the Bermudians that I know, and I'm not even just going to say black, but white Bermudians as well, even Portuguese Bermudians, tend to code switch when talking to people from other cultures, right? And um, you notice it daily. Most people don't notice it, but I, I pick it up daily, right? And like I said, I myself do it from time to time, right? And I personally, I hate it. Mm -hmm. um, could I just? Piggyback for 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I wrote a, um, another short little poem about this um, for, <laughs> for Oxford. You're not, not going to let me live that down. No. Well, I'm, I'm going to get a tattoo that says little Lip poem. Literally, we're going to get a tattoo after this. Um, so I wrote this speech for Oxford um, in after Dr. Rose May Hall, who is a linguist and was instrumental in getting Bermudian English put into the Oxford Dictionary. Mm. And the, the whole crux of that piece was that the way in which we speak, it is deemed to be slanderous. And right. how, how we do have to move, it is something that is ingrained, it is something that is always, it is muscle memory at this point. Yep. And because the Bermudian English model, how we do speak is deemed as something that is not proper. It's inferior. It right. is inferior to King's English, right. wild to say that and all. Um, <laughs> thank you. No, but it is something that we have to unlock from ourselves, right? We don't. I don't see it as code switching to speak in Bermudian English. I see code switching when I am switching between spaces that allow me comfortability or discomfort. Um, but that's something that, and I think that's. A, I guess for me, and, and I agree with you because of course I'm in tourism and yeah, I do yeah, tours yeah. and all of that. So I code switch all the time in and out. But I view it as more like I'll know this person. Do they even deserve to get me? Mm -hmm. 
Kristen, <laughs> you can <laughs> tell the girl, and that's fine. And when I feel that I can be comfortable with you, then I will show up as my authentic self. Right, right, right. So that and that has to be something that I we had to learn, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because you are taught that your accent is less than yes. is this. Yes. Um, you know, going back to uh, Suzette Lloyd's Ooh. sketches of Bermuda in 1835, when she talked about white children who, because they were being raised by enslaved people and their nannies, uh, adopted a disagreeable Negro, Negro Creole troll. Right. Yep. And so that has been what they feel about the, the Bermudian accent and to a large extent the black Bermudian accent. And you know that's what Rosie Hall's work looks at, especially as how it's used as minstrelly. It's mm. used as mocking. Caricature. We've always, we've all, I think, been in these meetings where someone who doesn't speak with the Romanian accent puts one on when they want to say, "Oh, this person is always late and lazy, <laughs> and they'll share up like, oh my gosh," and they put this accent <laughs> on in front of you, right? Yeah. I don't feel comfortable with that person, so they're not in my tribe, in my space where I need to show up as my authentic self. Do they need to do that work and sort themselves out? Absolutely, but that's not my work to do for them. Yeah. And, and I and I do also understand that that's a privilege for me because I don't work in that corporate space where I'm constantly being questioned and you know my credentials mm -hmm. questioned and this I you know I've created this other space for myself where generally I can be authentic. So I understand. Hey, you no, know, I, I was I was in in a, a more corporate space and I also hated it at the time, uh, the code switching. Um, but there have been lots more I think workshops and lectures that have explained like if you view it as tools, if you view it as yourself being bilingual. Ooh. Mm. If you view it as like, okay, I'm showing up in this space and I speak this language, and when I am not in this space, I speak this language. It's to me, it's an asset. It's a way for me to show up in each space and connect with the people in those spaces, and I just view it as as just an added thing that I can do. Right. What do we? Uh, my Hold thing on, is, I'm the questioner. Okay. <laughs> 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 because before we move on to uh, the next topic, I want you guys to explain maybe different things that can actually be done that we could set in place. I did have one more question along that same guideline that, for, that was for you, Kristen, because the way I view you, I view you as someone who's like brave, an entrepreneur, like someone I'm inspired by, I look up to, and I don't think that you're afraid to talk for other people as well as talk, talk for yourself. You, you expel so much energy, I feel, and obviously a lot of it's positive. But I can't imagine how much you also have to take on from being that person. Because when I think of somebody who's making changes and being vocal for others on this island, you know, um, social justice Bermuda, your side, you're always there in different spaces. Like the energy that it takes for you, how do you, how do you cope? Because you're that I find exhausting. Exhausting. Has there ever been a time prior to where, like, Kristen, where in the past, where you did so much for like tourism in the industry, you still are now? But did you ever feel like you had to diminish that part of personality of yourself just to like get people to understand what you're saying? Yeah, and I guess again, you know, you move through different parts of your career, right? So I can imagine when Wendell first showed up, you know, shiny penny in the business, you're that much more likely to assimilate. And then maybe you get to a place where you're like, okay, I have a few letters after my name, I have a few this, and you're still going to assimilate, but maybe you don't do it as much, and you just sort of start to move and shift into spaces. So for me, yes, over the course of my sort of adult life, I definitely have um, have taken on. Uh, feeling like something is my role and this is me and I'm gonna do that and then being like actually no that's not my work to do um, one of them is arguing with white people I don't do that uh, anymore I don't need to debate my humanity with someone online and that was something that I very much did through blogging and through social media was constantly in this space and it is exhausting and it's draining and every minute that I'm doing that I'm not over here building my community and working over here mm -hmm. in the spaces that I can have an impact so yes that's definitely shifted over time and some of it has had to shift like you said for my own mental health my own sense of like self-care um, and and I also yes had to make that decision um, as an entrepreneur how closely do I tie my entrepreneurial endeavors to my personal self and I did have I did have an actual moment where I sat down and thought about all of the cons that could happen if the person that owns this shop and does these tours is this girl that's loud over here about these things and I had to decide whether for myself I could keep these two things in separate silos and I decided for me I couldn't me personally and I understand that that's not the case for everybody but for me I felt like I can create a life for myself that where I can show up 
as myself in my business, in my prof in my personal life, in my professional life, in my activism, I can show up and and it's all a part of the Christian white experience. You know, it's all a part uh, of me and and I feel very grateful for that and for platforms like this and working with companies like Ren Rhee who are like, okay, uh, yeah, write a poem and see, let's see what happens. And they trust us to be both, you know, create something that's thought provoking, but also still authentically us. Um, so, yeah, I know it's not easy, and I know it's something that as you move through your careers, mm -hmm. and depending on the spaces you're in, and the companies you're in, and the communities, yeah, you may have to pull back on parts of yourself. And so I just feel very grateful that I am not doing that anymore. Right. I, I, I have to do it very rarely. And when I'm doing it, I'm like, oh my God, this is happening. Mm -hmm. I just, like, this is happening right now. Like, I, I, it doesn't happen to me that often, honestly. And, uh, and, I, I, and I actually, as you said, like, I'm a person that speaks up. But when it does happen, I'm often caught very off guard because I don't experience it as much as my friends who are in a space where they're constantly having to assimilate or shift or this. Um, right. And it's not always your... Also, it's not like your role to have to teach everyone no, in all every single no. moment, right? But exactly. I still sometimes I'm surprised by like, wow, you just froze just now. You just froze like a crazy dirt in headlights, and that is not you. I just was like, oh my gosh, this is a racism. It's happening. Like, and I and I will. It, it doesn't. It doesn't happen to me enough that it is muscle memory, right. unfortunately, mm -hmm. or fortunately. So when it comes to that as well, just you know, being that person to speak and teach other people, Adrian, I thought you might want to jump in on yeah, this topic as well. well. Peter, gosh. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, everything that the panelists are saying resonates with me, and I'm, again, very privileged and, and gracious, um, gr full of gratitude to be here. Uh, what Kristen just said uh, really resonated with me. I, at this point in my career and my life, I, I also don't often find myself going, oh, you know, I'm in that space. It did happen a couple, you know, a year ago, and I couldn't believe. I was like, I can't believe that I changed my behavior because of the way I thought that that person was going to perceive me. And I, it, 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 I impacted for ages. It was a, um, I can't stop know. thinking about it. It happened two years yeah. ago, and I can't stop thinking it's, about it. Um, but I think for the LGBT community, specifically gay people and lesbian people, and bisexual people, obviously, but a sexuality versus a gender thing, I should say. Um, like our Al Bermuda uh, organization did um, scientific surveys in 2016 and 2020 in Bermuda, registered, uh, sorry, not registered, uh, voting age Bermudians only, so no expats, uh, guest workers. Um, and it just, uh, you know, how many Bermudians believe that um, being gay or lesbian is choice or by what happened to you when you were young. And the data was 32% of Bermudians believe gay or lesbian is a choice, and further 15% think that being gay or lesbian is caused by your upbringing. So when you're faced with a, a workplace, you imagine, where you have 47% of people thinking that who you are is, you chose it and you did it to yourself, it changes the conversation or the dynamic you're having because they, they will, there is less uh, compassion because you're, you know, you, I get, well, you, you chose it to be your way. You know, I worked somewhere where the, they, did, they actually had, in, in, you know, in, in Bermuda, human rights protection for sexual orientation only came in for employment in well, in, well after I started working. But where I first worked had a clause that says, you know, you won't be fired uh, based on your sexual preference. And you know, I remember seeing that and going, oh. And I remember seeing going, that's great. Because at the time, there was, there was nothing in the law. So at least there was something contractually. And so I guess um, when I think about um, passing, you know, and not to take a, a, a race word, because I know that has a lot of um, historical and current um, connotations, but um, for me and my husband actually as well, um, when, we're being, when we're talking about our family and having a son, um, the, there's a lot of heteronormative behavior. I live in a heteronormative space. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it's an ideology, a worldview where if you are straight, you see things as being straight, so you just assume things are straight, and everybody's straight, and straight, straight, straight everywhere. Um, <laughs> you get a straight, and yeah, you get a straight. Like you, everybody gets a straight. <laughs> and so they'll see my ring and go, oh, where does your wife work? You know, just an assumption. And immediately in that instance, I have to choose whether I'm going to, are you with a white girl? <laughs> you, know, um, <laughs> you know, or you know, have a conversation with a straight person. And I, but I also have to think, am I going to, is this person worth the real Adrian? Because that's a lot of energy. Um, <laughs> or, but also, do I feel physically safe? safe exactly. You know, as I've worked in a, everywhere I've worked, I felt physically safe. So I won't. It's not workplace thing here, but 
you know, out in the community. Like, I have to go, I pause and go, am I going to do this? And that's because I grew up, you know, with all the stuff and the baggage attached to it, whereas I compare it to my husband, who didn't come out till much later in life. He carries the same privilege as me, European, white, male, cisgendered, and he doesn't put up with any of it, no matter where we are in Bermuda. He's like, husband, my husband, <laughs> my husband. Yeah. And so I, 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 it's funny, because I think that I come up so authentically me all the time, and I look at someone who has had even, even more privilege than me, which is shocking, because <laughs> I have, I'll tick a lot of the boxes, and then I just, it feels pretty amazing to, to mm. see that as well. And I just, I hope one day we're, we all have a you know, better feeling. The orchestra, I'm never gonna forget this, the vision and the sound of the orchestra singing. Uh, you guys, amazing, amazing. Awesome. Now I'm gonna throw this last question out to Wendell. And um, if anyone else wants to answer it, please like, let me know. And it's a would you rather question, okay? <laughs> so would you rather stay at a job where you have to assist in starting the process and addressing all the inconsistencies and the need to improve on equality in the workplace, or would you rather leave it and find a work at a corporation who has already started the work? I've done both. <laughs> I've done both. Um, so, and I touched on it a little bit earlier about um, we were doing diversity and inclusivity in the workplace, and I helped start one of those in the workplace before. Um, I ended up, my reason for leaving the workplace was because of, um, I had a better offer somewhere else. And so at the time, I, was th I wasn't thinking about the color of my skin, I was thinking of my family, I was thinking of you know, um, my future, so I, I ended up leaving. Um, I do wish I would have stayed though, um, for, for the simple reasons that, that we were talking about, is just you know, trying to build it, build on it, um, get more people to understand where I'm coming from, where the next person's coming from, and just get everyone to, you know, to relate to one another. I would have loved to stay there, but like I said, um, I had other things going on and I moved on. Now, I was, how can I put it? I was in a place, one of my previous employers, um, where this actually started up again, where they started doing all this, and I tried to get involved, um, but I just, it didn't feel genuine. It really didn't feel genuine, right? Um, just looking at the board of people that were there, um, it was mostly white folks. None of the black folks were involved because none of them were asked, right? They were asked, they asked all higher level people to come and lead this here diversity in the workplace and push it through. There's probably one black person there was a female, I believe, and she was there and, you know, she was very well spoken and she was pushing it through, but the rest of the folks there was white. I just, it didn't feel right for me. Um, so hang on, sorry, follow up. So in these, you know, diversity and inclusion pockets within corporations, should, uh, I don't wanna, I'm gonna ask it the way I'm gonna ask it. Like, should white people be the last people to actually join in? Should they not even be asked? No, no. Should no, they just of, be allies? Of, well, no, I didn't mean it that way. So the whole point of, so I probably left some context off. The whole point of it starting, right, was because of, um, there was something going on in the news at the time um, it escapes my memory, but it had something to do with um, 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 a, a black man. I think a black man was killed in America George. or something like that. I think, yeah, I think it was George Floyd or something like that, or someone probably before him or something. Um, and it, that's where it started from. The whole conversation started around that, and they're talking about, okay, you know, we want to get more people to understand diversity, inclusivity, get everyone to understand one another, and that's where it started from. And so you would think that, all right, you know, you're going to have a black person head in this. Like, that's where my train of thought went at the time, but it was all white folks, one black female, and myself. And it just didn't feel right. It felt like they were trying to, you know what, we're, we're about diversity and inclusivity, and, and this company is going places. It felt, it felt like a sham. It, it, it really did. It felt, didn't feel genuine. It really felt like they're just trying to display it out to the public that, you know what, this is what we're doing, and we're a good company. It, it, it didn't feel genuine. So it didn't feel like it had you no. in, in mind even? No, it didn't. No. I did not feel part of it at all. Well, I, okay, because you said, I just want to throw out one more question to Jessica with thinking about having someone in mind. Um, describe a time you realized an environment like was not made with you in mind, and what did you do? <laughs> mm. um, there's definitely been a lot of that. Um, <laughs> and that kind of can come from either an accessibility standpoint where you know I can't even get into a lot of buildings in Bermuda. Um, I can't even get on the public bus. Um, so there is a lot of spaces where, you know, I'm, I'm not welcome. 
Um, and even just coming here, some of the sidewalks weren't, weren't good or they didn't have the curb cutouts or they have it on one side and then they have a step on the other. So I can get into the street, but I can't get off. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of a lot of little things on the accessibility side, but it's definitely a lot more with um, just the perceptions. And I think maybe a little bit more in the workforce um, is that there's this idea that if, you know, you hire somebody with a disability, they're going to have or you're gonna have to go above and beyond in assisting or helping or guiding them because there's this notion that they have these special needs and it's something that is not a special need, it's a human need. You know, we all have something that um, we need to help us get through the day or a work day or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's just having that mind switch that it's, it's not a special need if they need more assistance in one area, it's a human need. Thank you. And I'll finish this out with trying to address everyone with it, but what is something that you want the audience, Chris, and I'll throw it to you first, what is something that you want the audience here to leave with from this discussion? Um, I mean, I don't know. I guess in any of these spaces, you just sort of hope that people leave feeling like they're, they want to start a conversation or be part of a conversation, that they want to go back to people in their world, in their sphere. Um, you know, I want them to uh, just feel, I guess, a little bit more confident in thinking that you know you have the ability and the power within yourself to be part of a of a systemic and seismic change um, you know and and that to me is not something that necessarily shifts a whole nation or a whole company but it can just shift your household or your department or the people sitting around your cubicle you know it's just about putting yourself in the space to be part of the conversation now earlier on we like in previous meetings we talked about how Everyone wants to start these things, and everyone wants to get them done, and everyone wants to be included, and everyone wants to try, you know, gun hope, we want to get this done. But working in a corporation like this, people tend to get busy. So I'm going to give this to Bergert, and you could explain a little bit, like, how can people get started without using the excuse and actually follow through without getting busy? Yeah. And the thing is, and I'm hearing what everyone has got to say, is that we we recruit for diversity, right? But we onboard for similarity. We we want people to come into our workspaces okay. and then be like us. And and by doing that, we mm. as as organisations, we hugely miss out on the resilience and and attributes of people from intersectional groupings, um, because there is a resilience. There, there's a diversity that that adds to the strength of an organisation. So we we have to get past this this mind frame of. Um, come and work for us, but then be like us. And we have to start to see diversity, equity, and inclusion as a business strategy. Because if you, if you go and do your research, you'll see that those organizations actually make more profit. Mm. Right? So, mm -hmm. so if, you do, if you boil it down to your bottom line, is that you will be more successful as an organization. Mm. But we, we sort of put it, put it in the background of that's the last thing I'm going to do, and it's sort of a tick mark box. Or we, we claim to be a meritocratic um, organization and we brand ourselves as we've got inclusive, inclusivity down to the T um, in our policies and, and that's a way especially how white males feel that I've done my job oh, we've got a policy for women and for black people uh, for gay people in the workplace and that's us you know we, we've done our work but that's not that we have to get to a place where we value diversity and where we see it as a business strategy going forward thank you Adrian, do you have an action point that people will probably take away and do? So I, it's something I, I talk about with my son all the time. He's eight and you know he's flexing into his own individuality. Um, I always tell him, uh, be the best. I always say to him, why, why, why should you be yourself and not be like everyone else? And he thinks about it and I say to him, I was like, just think about this. Like, everyone else is taken. <laughs> So you might as well be the best you that you can be. So that's what I would share if, if you take away one thing, like be the best you you can be. Everyone else is taken anyway, so you might as well do it. Aisha? I mean, I like to close a circle and be cyclical, so we'll just go back to James Baldwin. I think it's really <laughs> important to know who you are, where you come from, and I don't mean all of you lot need to go up on like 23 and Me and like figure out who your great, great, greats were, because it might get, disturbing and upsetting for me too. Um, <laughs> but I think it's important to understand who you are in the context of any system, right? Like start with you. It's important to start with you, look at yourself, have a little reflective moment, I don't know, meditate, get, get up in there. 
um, because you're the only person that can decide where you're going and you need to know where you're starting from. Jessica? I think um, just be you know, comfortable being uncomfortable and having those conversations and um, just really allowing yourself to think about um, maybe the stereotypes that you think of, of somebody else and how you can change that. And Wendell? Um, Jessica, you sort of stole what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, I didn't want to um, give any, um, quote anyone or anything like that. I just wanted to rather give everyone homework. It's to uh, have an uncomfortable conversation mm -hmm. with someone whom you normally would not. That's what I would like for everyone here to do, even those listening. Just have that uncomfortable conversation. It will help um, you to understand that person better. It will help that person to understand you better. No matter what it is, have that conversation. That's great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to throw some questions out so that you guys, so I want you guys to be able to throw some questions out to the panelists, anyone who might have some questions. So think of them right now, and I'm just going to end this by just going down the line and asking you guys, like, if there's any way that anyone in this audience could even reach out to you or find out more about you and things like that, if that's what you're willing to offer. So if somebody wants to, you know, tone in more and maybe talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, would you be willing to, like, give, you know, share your information or how people can reach you? Absolutely. Um, uh, me personally or um, through Out Bermuda, um, outbermuda.org, uh, we do, uh, we go into workplaces and do discussions on DEI and um, workplace inclusivity and safety and what it looks like to be psychologically safe for queer folks in your job. So please reach out. All our information is on the website. Um, yeah, so for Aisha and I, uh, for Brackish Pond so Lit. So glad you did both of us. <laughs> for Brackish <laughs> Pond Lit, um, obviously we are open and available to do workshops within your spaces as well on Bermudian history, culture, literature. Um, and uh, we actually have a lecture on October 11th for the Bermuda National Trust, uh, which looks at gaps in the cultural memory. Um, so it's called Cartographies of Loss and mapping out all of the different stories and sites and things that we as a people have lost and how we regain that and, and in regaining that, how it helps us to move forward. Um, on an ongoing basis, of course, I do tours. I'm in St. George's. You can find us here. If you want to take a class with Aisha at the college, she's up there. Um, and yeah, I'm itskristen.com on all the platforms. I'm not on any platforms. She's not on any platforms. So I'm switching organizations, and the best would be to get hold of me personally on social media, um, on LinkedIn or on Facebook. And my name is actually not too difficult to remember. It's, just, it's hamburger, and you take the ham away, and you add a T at the end. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I can be found at Renaissance Rea, of course, you know, spoken about it before. Um, you can, like Barger, you can see, find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Randall Hunt. I don't change that. That's E-L-L, -L, by the way, not A-L or one L. It's E-L-L. -L. That actually happens quite often. Quite often people get it wrong. So, That's yeah. a little bit worse. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just social media as well. <laughs> Great, so I'm just gonna wrap it up and then we're gonna take some questions. But I think generally the points that you know the panelists have made for everyone to think that they could start on or work toward are as follows. It's being comfortable with talking about uncomfortable conversations with people. You know, um, starting small in your smaller circles even and getting those steps just right there and not neglecting just because maybe it's a big corporation it shouldn't be your responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility at the end of the day. And treating it like a business policy. Like Bernard said, I thought that was really smart to include that there because we tend to obviously try to get those policies and get everything in our workspace done and we miss out on the other things that actually help to make it flourish. So treating it like a work policy and then also as Aisha and Kristen have said often, it's just like remembering and understanding the history of a space as well that can really help you move forward to understanding where you want to go in the future. And the last thing Wendell said about doing your homework and you know, just being, oh, Wendell, I forgot it, it went out of my hair. Uncomfortable. Being uncomfortable, but also talking. Yes, take a chance and talk to Let someone that you don't normally talk to. So that's something we wanna close out with. All right, so thank you everyone for having this panel discussion. And are there any questions now for the panelists? All right, let's go.
I will throw this either to Wendell or Burgett. Um, well, that's, that's actually a cool question. <laughs> um, I would say just keep reaching out. Just, just keep reaching out. Um, some people, as, as a black person myself, you know, um, we tend to think that there is always more to something than that, that first question. So you may get some reluctance from some. They're like, what are you actually trying to do here? So they'll probably question your motives. But if you keep asking, um, explain yourself to them what, you're trying, what it is you're trying to do, you can, you can get someone to join. You just got to be persistent. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so then it's a very good question because what, what we are asking people from the, with diverse backgrounds is to minimize the differences, right? Is to come into the workspace and, and not be completely themselves. Um, I mean, a very simple example of that is, is a black woman going to an interview and making sure that she's got a Western type of hairstyle. Um, for that interview so that she can be selected in that role. So, so from an emotional point of view, going into a workspace by, by assimilating is, is a coping strategy. And, and through that coping strategy leads us to a place where we feel, um, well, angry, frustrated, um, resentful. Um, it leads to, to anxieties and depression. It, it's, you lose a sense of self, like, like Wendell said, that at some point you, you just do it automatically. It, it's a coping mechanism um, to do that. So, so the, the, yeah, the, there's a tremendous psychological uh, backlash on, on organizations asking people to minimize. And, and most organizations are actually in a space like that, where we do ask people to minimize the differences. It, it, it is that we, we value e equal human rights, right? So we, we, we want to treat everyone the same. And, and, and that's not a bad place to start, is, is to have that awareness, to seek communality. That's what we do. We, we, we seek common ground. But, but in that is also the problem. In that is that we don't value diversity. We, we don't ask people to present your full self within, within the workspace as, as, as well. So, so how workspaces can, can um, improve themselves is through a culture of, of uh, having a growth mindset, addressing the leadership um, team within an organization, addressing the culture in the organization. And, and there's actually assessments that you can do to see how interculturally competent an organization is. There, there's a scientific proven uh, tool to, to do that. So the more that we can bring those measurements into organizations to see, but what is it that we need to fix? How can we make our workplace more transformative um, and, and accepting psych psychologically safe? So the, work, the workplace isn't the place for, for therapeutic interventions, right? We, we're not asking people, cr asking organizations to create a space where people can heal. That, that's completely a different, a different space that we need to go into. But we can ask organizations to create a space where people can feel safe to be completely themselves. And then also from an organizational point of view, harvest the, the benefits of, of that. And then also create a workspace where people feel, I belong, I want to come to work. We spend half our, our adult lives within a workspace. Um, so why not have that as a pleasant experience and a place where we feel that, that we can belong? So I hope that answered your question. Okay. Sorry, there's a lady behind us had a question.
I think I would probably want to throw this either to Kristen or, or Birgit. And I think also when, when she's asking the question, what came to my mind was just really explaining what intersectionality really yeah. is. So whoever okay, I, I'll, I'll jump in and please yeah. also, <laughs> also add to that. Um, I, I think it's maybe important to, to just have a look at where, it, where, where the term was coined. And the, the term was coined by, by Kimberly Crimshaw, I think, in 1989. And, and that, that was all based on, I mean, she's, she's a racial advocate, and she, she, she had this, this um, black woman that, that came to her as a client that said that I, you know, I can't go and work in a certain mechanical shop because that is only for men. I, they, they don't see me as strong enough, and that's a men's, a men's job. But at the same time, I can't go and work in customer service because they want a white female to work in, in that in that realm to speak to the customer base so so one can almost say well there, there's almost like a do double discrimination going on in that and I think it's important to to realize where it comes from it, the inter the word inter intersectionality came from from a, a, a woman's voice right and that was also on the fourth wave of feminism um, and if you think about where feminism started was was by white middle class cisgender women um, and by complete exclusion of people from other ra racial groupings, and it was only on a fourth wave of fem feminism where, where this came up. So I think maybe is, is you know to, to start to grasp our understanding of where intersectionality was, or the, the word was coined, was was at that at that point in time. And then of course, it, I mean, but intersectionality was existing much much longer before that. But it is you know how how that shows up in our workspaces and in our society at the moment it becomes much more complex, right? And it's almost like if, if you think on two axes of understanding and of intersectionality, and both these axes are on, on wheels, it's a continuously shifting um, uh, conversation and paradigms that, that, that is incredibly um, complex to, to understand. And I think that, that's really the crux of this, is that we, we, can't, we can't come to a place of, of resolution to a lot of these, but we can try our best to have the conversations and to and to move closer again to, to one another. Yes, I agree. And I think it's also important to sort of see all of these issues as different sides of the same cube, right? Like we're talking about a white patriarchal society. And so when you're looking at those who are oppressed within that space, it shows up in different ways depending on your the identity that you have and that you embody. So. It, it, it is all the same conversation, you know, this, the same conversation that will say that, you know, uh, a gay man is, you know, not masculine enough is, this, is, is, is the same conversation as saying that a black woman isn't feminine enough. You know, it's, it's all of these things that were put in place centuries ago and we're now we're trying to dismantle different systems and depending on whose voice is the loudest at any one time, it can maybe feel like th the space that you inhabit is being ignored or this topic that's really important to you is not getting the attention Attention. And, and for me, I just, in my, the way that I look at social justice and, and intersectionality is that when I'm, when I'm talking about this issue, I'm also talking about this issue. I'm never, I'm never having one conversation. And, and, and I view that as my responsibility that when I show up in a space to talk about this, I'm also like, well, don't forget about that over here. And I think that's, you know, what, it, it is hard and it's an ongoing conversation and the access is always moving, um, but I'm not ever, choosing one identity, I, I can't, I can't choose one. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense for me to think about, okay, I only have this one fight. They're all my fights, they're all, all of our fights. And so either you are a part of it all, or you're really not doing the work. Thank you. Does anyone, yeah. yeah. I have a question or a comment. Yeah, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Yeah, can, I, can I add to that? And that's, um, I don't know if you are part of sort of uh, some of the conversations about disability on Twitter and how very quickly accommodations were made 
when the pandemic started and all of a sudden people could work from home and there was this and there was that things that disability advocates have been asking for forever and were denied and then the second that a company was like we need this in order to keep operating and keep making money okay yeah, sure here's your double monitor here's mm -hmm. your this take a chair from home do this sign on when you can all of a sudden the accommodations were not a big ask and disability advocates on twitter were very angry about that and rightly so they were just like we have been asking for this forever and it, and it was ignored. And like you said, the environment is, it is possible to make an environment that provides accommodations. If you are wearing contacts right now or glasses, you have an accommodation for a disability. But it's not looked at in the same way. And you know, that's a part of the ongoing conversation as well. Yeah. yeah. The same conversation you guys brought up about knowing the history and looking at space and like, is this made for you? No, it was not built for you because it was built for a mindset of like either way beyond or just never with you in thought. So yeah. So is there another question I saw a hand? Wait, you said? Sorry, was it not working? His had his hand up for a minute too. One, sorry, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. I mean, I think you can, you can f ask the question or directive that you're actually trying to get to the point of because if you say professional, it's what are we saying? Like, are you asking me to speak in a different way? Are you asking me to be, be less emotional? Are you asking me to come be show on up time. on time? So th that isn't a good signifier for all of those things. So you need to be directed Brethren, show up on time. Do you know what I mean? Or don't please, don't, I mean, probably don't say brethren. I, well, I will say brethren, but um, maybe not. You know what I mean? It's like we can't use that as the bubble of which all of those things go into because then it does get pejorative. Mm. Um, but if you are saying like this isn't the space to be, bring your personal details into it, your personal matters, then that's better than saying you need to be a little bit more professional. So we do have to wrap this up right now. If there are any questions left over though, please feel free to talk to the panelists after this discussion. Again, just gonna wrap it up by mentioning the points that I really want you guys to leave with from this organization is from starting small within your groups, talking to people that you don't, wouldn't normally talk to and just starting there even is a great place to start mm -hmm. treating mm -hmm. these discussions about inclusivity and you know equity and equality and intersectionality like a business transaction as well, so, and a business policy and what Jessica let off with, I'm just going to end with that, is just being comfortable to talk about things that are uncomfortable. So thank you again for everyone for being here. Thank you.